it shrouded off the martyr. This is the story of Poplar's Rebel Councillors and Guardians 1919 to 1925. This is where we are, Poplar, straight after the First World War. Two and a half thousand acres roughly, population of 160,000, 24% poverty. Now, as you can imagine, if, to be officially in poverty, you have to be really, really, really poor. There's lots of people who are poor without being officially in poverty. So the fact that nearly a quarter of people are officially in poverty tells you how poor it is. 83 out of 1,000 children died in the first couple of years after being born. More than 3,000 people live in overcrowded housing. More than two people per room. So pause a second. Count the number of rooms in your house. Double it. There would need to be one more person in there for it to be officially overcrowded. And 33,000 people live like that. More than a quarter of men worked in transport. The borough was very much dominated, firstly by the docks and secondly by the railways. And that's quite important in terms of the politics and health develop over the next couple of years. More than half of women work for wages, so don't be getting the impression that the men were out slaving all day and the women were at home doing all the housework and looking after the kids. They were doing all the housework and looking after the kids, but they were working for wages as well. This, for example, is the borough where the Bryant and Main Match Factory was, Match Women's Strike of the late 19th century. There's a lot of food packing, textile industry, that kind of area. If you became destitute or poor, you went to the poor law guardians and they would probably send you to the workhouse and you'd be lucky if you ever got out again. So the job of the poor law guardians was to look after poor people. But given that the whole law was based on the assumption that poor people were there because of their own moral failings, you can imagine the kind of way they looked after them. Now, a very important thing happened in 1918. Representation of the People Act gave the vote to all women over 30. And it also gave the vote to all working class men. Until that point, an awful lot of working class men, particularly the kind of um, unskilled or semi-skilled working class men in a borough like Poplar, just didn't have the vote at all. And the other thing it did was something called pauper enfranchisement. It allowed poor people to vote for the boards of guardians. Until 1918, if you actually received health from them, which meant being sent to the workhouse, or on occasionally if you were lucky getting something called outdoor relief, which is like dole money, if you got help from the Guardians, you weren't allowed to vote in the elections for them because you were clearly undeserving. And that was the problem, you say. As soon as you let poor people vote for the Guardians, what did they do? They elected a bunch of socialists. And they also elected a bunch of socialists to run the council. Um, and before then, Poplar Council had been run by an organisation called the Poplar Borough Municipal Alliance, which was just a club of business owners who stood um, themselves in elections or occasionally backed vicars, anyone who would defend their interests. The coalition government has been elected on a landslide, which is a Tory Liberal coalition with the Liberal Prime Minister, David Lloyd George. The following year, 1919, a bunch of lefties get elected across London, and in Poplar they now hold 39 of the 42 seats on the council, the most famous of which was George Lansbury. Went on to become leader of the Labour Party in the 1930s, one of the best-known socialists in Britain at the time, also the best-known male supporter of women's rights as well. That's Bessie Lansbury's wife, that's Sam March, who went on to become the mayor. What we've got here is working-class political representation. For the first time, working-class people have been able to elect people who stand as candidates for the working class. An awful lot of people have stood as representatives of the working class, but have not then gone on to govern as representatives of the working class. But our popular socialists, they did because they believed in that rhetorical question, which George Lansbury said, Labour councils must be different from those who have displaced. Well, why displace them? Why bother beating the Tories in the elections if you're just going to act like them if you get elected? So they did loads of things to improve quality of life for local working class people. They appointed housing inspectors who went round putting notices of improvement on slums, forcing the private landlords to do them up. Um, they built new housing, they set up TB dispensaries, tuberculosis was a major killer um, in all working class districts actually at that time. They expanded maternity and child welfare services, which went on to significantly reduce that horrifying figure I told you earlier about um, infant mortality. They improved the baths and wash houses. I have to say one of my favourite moments when researching this, going through the old minutes, was reading a decision of the Baths and Wash Houses Committee of Poplar Council, and I quote, we resolved to heat the second class swim. <laughs> which tells you two things. One, that there used to be two classes of swimming, the first class and second one. And the other, the Tories didn't heat the water. They didn't even heat the water for the swim at work when working class people went swimming. So the our Labour Council heat the second class swim. And when do we want it now? Brilliant. 
they started bringing in electrification to the borough. Um, you've got to remember this time, there's you know, lots of streets, there's no electric street lights or anything. And they set about de casualising work. So people who worked in council services on casual contracts were put on permanent contracts. They introduced a minimum wage of £4 a week, which was all right in those days. Then what happens is after a brief post war boom, there's then a slump. So what happened in 1920s was a collapse in British export trade. Now, there's a collapse in export trade. The first type of work that gets affected is the docks, because that's where everything's coming in and going out. Knock-on effects, the railways, which are driving all the goods out of the docks, or not anymore. So a borough like Poplar, in fact, Poplar, more than anywhere else, takes a hit for this recession. Dock work is already quite casual, so a load of casual dockers were just flung onto the dole. A load of permanent dockers ceased to be permanent dockers and became casual dockers, while at the same time, people who've been made redundant out of other industries, came down to the docks looking for work. So you had a massive rise of un unemployment. And one of the things that the socialists around Poplar Council wanted to do was public works. What you get is work that desperately needs doing, not being done, and people who could very well do that work on the dole. The government announced that it would fund local councils that did these public work schemes. So on the back of that, Poplar Council set one up, which was laying roads, and then the government said, you're not having the money. After all, the government said we will only fund public work schemes which prioritise ex-servicemen, men who fought in the First World War. Poplars didn't prioritise ex-servicemen, it prioritised people with large or young families. They decided to prioritise on the basis of need. And also in a borough where a large number of dock workers and rail workers have been exempted from conscription. So the government had told them not to go to war because their work here in Britain was too important. And then having done that, and now they're, they're, their work suddenly isn't important enough to survive a recession, and the government says, no, we won't even fund you to get jobs under public works after all. That's the first thing that leaves public council with a bit of a funding problem. And the other thing is a basically very unfair funding system. Now, we still have an unfair funding system for local government, which is why council tax is nearly double in Hackney, what it is in Westminster, nearly double in Newham, what it is in Wandsworth, because if you have to fund your local services from local taxes people who need more services have to pay even more to get them. The phrase they kept using in Poplar actually was the poor keeping the poor. You still have that now, but it was even worse then. And one of the reasons it was even worse then is the equivalent of what is now dole money was also a local charge. So benefits paid to people who are out of work were paid for out of the local rates. So in an area like Poplar, where you're now at massive unemployment, you've just been done over by the government on your public work team, and you've got to meet the needs of this borough by taxing the very people whose needs you're trying to meet. You've got a massive financial crisis. In those days, borough councils paid what were called precepts to cross London bodies. Now it's to the GLA and Transport for London via the GLA and London Fire Brigade, etc. In those days, it was the London County Council which is a, a, a predecessor of the GLA. The Metropolitan Asylum Board, which ran hospitals for sick and mentally ill people. The Metropolitan Police and the Water Board. And what the Public Council said is we're not, we're not going to pay those. We're not going to collect it, we're not going to pay it. Because our people can only afford to pay the bits that we need to provide the local services. We're not, we're not going to pay the other stuff. And they knew very well that they were breaking the law. Edgar Lansbury, who is George Lansbury's son, says the law and justice are two different things. Sam March who was the mayor in 1921, he said, the law, well, the master class has made the law. The London County Council and the Metropolitan Asylum Board take to court because they've got the money and they know they're right and they, they think they'll get it by going to court. And here we have outside the court, George Lansbury, John Skur, Sam March and Charlie Sumner. And the miserable looking git is the town clerk. <laughs> so he's the equivalent of like the chief executive of Hackney Council or something, right? He was just, we've told... We're going to go bankrupt and go to prison or something. So he doesn't look very happy, but he does what he's told. But they don't just do this as martyrs themselves. They're not just, you know, 30 or 40 individual martyr councillors. What they do is they mobilise. So they get loads of public meetings where they explain the case to local people. They have big public rallies in support of them. That's them marching along the east of India Dock Road and they're marching all the way to the Strand, to the High Court. They just get up and say, well, basically, we know it's illegal. We don't care because we're right and you're wrong. And they would read out long statements describing poverty in Poplar and describing how unfair the system was. End of August, demonstration at Tower Hill. Big rally there, a lot of trade union support for, for that one. Um, and by this time, they know they're going to go to prison. 
Arrest started on the 1st of September 1921, and thousands and thousands of people turned out to put guards on the Skurs' house. The point of these guards wasn't to stop them being arrested. It was to make a big show of defiance that the whole of Poplar's working class was behind what they were doing. This is Minnie Lansbury. Minnie Lansbury, before becoming a Poplar councillor, was the Assistant Secretary of the East London Federation of Suffragettes, so she was assistant to Sylvia Pankhurst. She was a Jewish, communist, feminist, labour movement activist in the East End of London, and you just think, what's not to like? <laughs> She's just willingly and energetically going off to prison, um, having her hands shaken and, and, and willing to go. 25 men went to prison, by the way, and five women. And the five women were all arrested on the same day, all at Poplar Town Hall which was a perfect excuse for a massive mobilisation. Someone from the crowd shouted out, well, we might have let the men go, but we can stop the women get taken away. At which point Susan Lawrence, who was one of the women, said, not likely, the blokes can go to prison, I can too, you lot aren't stopping me go. The women councillors are speaking from the um, balcony that's in the background. And there's Julia Skirt, another of the women councillors. If the government, having imprisoned the councillors, then decided to send bailiffs or whoever into Poplar to collect the rate, collect the precept over the head of the council, they were all going to refuse to pay the rent. And because the government knew they were serious and capable of delivering that, they never tried. The other thing on that placard that's worth a mention is the heading, which is the Daily Herald. The Daily Herald was a daily national socialist newspaper that always backed workers' struggles, that backed progressive struggles around the world as well. George Lansbury was its editor, and it played a, a really important role in this struggle. So, off they go to prison. Like I said, 25 men, Brixham Prison, five women in Holloway Prison. Prison conditions were terrible. A lot of the councillors ended up in the hospital wing within days. Every night, massive crowds outside the window, cheering them on, singing the red flag, hearing speeches. George Lansbury even done speeches through the cell windows, through the cell bars to them. And when they offered to move him into a more comfortable, larger cell further inside the prison, he said no, because he wanted to stay in the one where he could do the speeches. Herbert Morrison was the mayor of Hackney at the time, and he took a completely opposite view to George Lansbury and the popular councillors. He thought it was very, very naughty to break the law, and what Labour should do is obey the law and prove how responsible and respectable we all are, and then we can get elected into power. Um, remember, by the way, this time there's never been a Labour government. He pursued Lloyd George, the Prime Minister. Lloyd George was on a recuperative holiday in Scotland at the time, so Herbert Morrison actually had to follow him round the Highlands. We eventually trapped him down in a place called Gairlock, where he begged him to take action. And Lord George replied that there is only one way to deal with unemployment, and that is to wait for better times. <laughs> Thanks for that, Mr Lord George. Yeah. Meanwhile, they fight back against the appalling prison conditions, and, and they win. They win better conditions, but they also even win the right to meet as a council in the prison. And from then onwards, they meet in, in the governor's big boardroom. And the women get brought over in a car from Holloway to Brixton to join in the meetings. And, and the minutes are brilliant because it, it, it'll have, um, you know, num number one, prison conditions improving, great. Uh, number two, campaign um, for the equalisation of rates. And they'll be saying uh, there was a brilliant public meeting at um, an old Ford Road the other day, but we're worried there's not enough posters up in windows in this part of Bow or something like that. Then item number three would be rats on Ellathorpe Street. Because they're still dealing with the mundane business of a council because they still remember what they're there for which is to improve life for working class people in other places shoreditch council voted by one vote not to do the same as popular when the right-wing labor councillors crossed the floor and voted with the tories but eventually two councils did vote to do what popular had done and not hand over the precepts and that was two neighboring boroughs to Hackney, stepney and bethnal green joe vaughan the mayor of bethnal green at the time quite a high up member of the Communist Party. They voted to join in and do what Poplar did once the Poplar councillors were already in prison. Poplar had decided this more than six months ago, so I do think it was a bit late. The other council that voted to do the same now was Stepney, and that did it on a resolution proposed by Mr Clement Attlee. He said at the time, I've always been a constitutionalist, but the time has come to kick. So he was very much saying that he agrees with Herbert Morrison normally, but he thought this was a sufficiently exceptional situation not to. Ta-da! They won! After all these demonstrations, particularly two other councils voting to do the same thing, they'd been in prison for six weeks and they won. When they went to prison, they went to prison indefinitely because they went to prison for contempt of court. If you get sent to prison for contempt of court, you are sent until such time as you purge your contempt. So, until such time as they collected the precepts and handed them over to the London County Council. And they became, on their release, the first people ever 
to be freed from a contempt of court imprisonment without having first purged their contempt. So what did they win? The local authorities, Financial Provisions Act 1921, it created cross-London pooling of outdoor relief costs, like dole money. It's the, it's the help you get off the guardians without being sent to the workhouse. And it will be pooled up to scales set by the, by the Minister of Health. Popular gains over a quarter of a million pound a year. A really quite significant redistribution of wealth from the rich boroughs to the poor boroughs. This is a great discouragement to those who believe in constitutional action and a great encouragement to those who believe in revolutionary methods, said the Tory MP. Um, for Poplar, a fellow by the name of Blair. That's just one part of the victory rally in Victoria Park. Fuck you!